Good evening, brothers, and welcome to our risk management call, all after house life safety. Uh, this evening on the call, we've got Lee Miller, the Vice President of S&E by F&H, and Greg Summers is the AED for uh, the F&H as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to them. Remind, reminder to everybody that this presentation is being recorded, and at any time you can either ask a question in the chat box, put a comment in the chat box, or submit a question using the Q&A section in the middle of the screen. So uh, Lee, take it away. Thanks, James, and uh, good evening, brothers. Uh, while I'm uh, known as Lee Miller in the former world, when I talk through, uh, walk through the doors of the Ohio Sigma chapter, I'm known as the old man, uh, where I've been the advisor for the past 24 or so years. Uh, every board needs a nice mix of talent, and my business career provided me with a building and construction knowledge base that allows me to contribute to the SAE life safety and construction needs. And a part of that knowledge came from membership in the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, and an organization called Campus Fire Watch. Uh, in fact, if you're, if you're interested in, uh, in D.C. and you want to go in March of uh, next year to attack the Hill and advocate for, for uh, fire safety on college campuses, send me an email and I'll be happy to fill in the blanks for you. Uh, if those of you who are listening tonight need information, uh, as in uh, names of qualified contractors in your market uh, or just information, uh, feel free to call Greg or, or I. Uh, there's a good chance that we can hook you up, possibly help you through uh, design and building and construction processes. Uh, also appropriate to know that F&H is in the business of providing financial resources to home corporations. Uh, particularly in the life safety needs. So if you, if, if there is a need, if there's anybody listening that's on Home Corps or those, share that with your Home Corps, we're in a position to uh, help you in the financial world if, if need be. Greg? Uh, good evening. My name is Greg Summers. Um, as James said, I'm the Associate Executive Director of SA Financial and Housing Corporation. I'm a 1998 graduate of Michigan State University. Uh, after that, I attended law school and then moved out to Los Angeles, California, where I did insurance defense litigation at a law firm out there. In 2003, I was hired by SA to head up a new entity um, under uh, the SA umbrella that had a focus on housing. At the time, we were called SA Services. We've since changed our name to SA Financial and Housing Corporation. And I've been employed for almost uh, 10 years now with them, uh, like I said, with a focus on chapter housing. We've got a number of uh, goals and intended outcomes that we want to cover and hope that you can come away with some good information that can have a positive impact on your chapter. Uh, Lee is going to cover what those intended outcomes are below. Well, first of all, I guess from my standpoint, I think from everybody, uh, no one wants to make a call to a parent or a guardian uh, announcing that their, their son has... Uh, burned or died in a, in a fire, and, and that's just a huge thing in, in my book, and I hope it is in everybody else's as well. Uh, we'd also like to show you ways that you can reduce your uh, chapter operating costs and expenses as it relates to the national risk management fees. Uh, obviously, we want to provide a safe environment to all the occupants and the guests uh, that might be in the chapter house increase the awareness of, of the life safety technologies that exist in the industry today, and of course inform the undergraduate and house corporations that sprinkler systems can be paid for the, through the savings uh, of, of reduction in uh, property insurance. Uh, we'd also uh, like to provide uh, some uh, the safest possible house uh, compared to all the others on campus. Uh, if they're all pristine, we'd like to be right up there with them. Uh, and, of course, uh, provide a, an online access to materials and information uh, related to the chapter house. And as James said, this will be online so you can go back and use it as a resource uh, later on. So if you don't catch everything we say, it'll, it'll be on uh, PGI Net. Greg? All right. <laughs> So the heading for each slide is called Chapter House Safety. Why is a safe house so important 
that SE actually has it listed as one of the 12 core areas of the True Gentleman Initiative. Go ahead, Lee. So again, we're back to saving lives, uh, reducing the property insurance by as much as 30%. So if you've got a 1,000 square foot house, your property insurance is probably about 10 grand. And we're, we think, uh, we know at least in examples that we have around the country that we can we can reduce that to about six grand uh, if you have a fire sprinkler system. Uh, in addition, you can reduce your risk of fees at the national level by a, by ten percent if you get a good rating on your your insurance inspection, which takes takes place about every three years. It represents about thirty four bucks per person. So, I don't know how many members in your chapter? Uh, that can be a hunk of money as as well, and. Uh, you know, most people uh, like to live in a good place. They like to live in a safe place. Most parents uh, want their their undergraduate their kids to live in a, in a good, safe uh, location. So we believe that if you have a safe house and and you have all the life safety needs, that that your membership will actually go up, and the number of people who choose to live in the house uh, will go up. And you'll see there on some statistics about how many deaths there are in fires and, and how many of them are, are in off-campus houses without this kind of protection. Greg? All right. Uh, so this webinar is being broken into a number of topics. Uh, some of the topics we will present some facts to you guys, and some of them we've got some videos related to these topics. The topics that we want to cover include fire alarms, sprinkler systems. We'll talk a little bit about um, central station monitoring. We're, we're going to talk about fire extinguishers, emergency lighting, electrical safety, passive egress, fire rated items, and then some basic checklists. We're hoping um, by having a combination of the videos and the facts that we can keep your interest peaked a little bit longer. So just bear with us. Um, we wanted to start out with um, a video that has really nothing to do with Chapter House Life Safety. Um, let me bring this video up. Uh, share. Oops. Give me one second. Share. Oops. Keeps coming off of it. So give me a second. Hmm. Might need your help here, James. Oh, there we are. All right. Here we are. Got to come down and hit play. All right. So um, what we have here is an insurance institute decided to crash a 1959 Chevy Bel Air into a 2009 Chevy Malibu. As you can see from the video, the newer car with the new technology has a windshield that doesn't shatter, has airbags that go off, it's able to protect the driver much better than the 1959 Chevy Bel Air. So you may be asking, why do we show you guys this? Well, fire alarms, sprinkler systems, fire rated doors, surge protectors, grounded outlets, these are all technologies that have been developed to save lives in chapter houses, and these technologies continue to get better and better every year. So as these technologies increase, obviously we have the opportunity to um, put these into your, into your fraternity houses, and that's what SA Financial and Housing Corporation is here to do, is to provide resources, information on all these new technologies that ultimately, hopefully, save lives someday. So you can really see from watching this video what a difference that makes, the, the technologies. All right, uh, just one more thing. According to safety engineers at the scene, the driver of the 2009 Chevrolet Malibu would have likely suffered a slight knee injury and the driver of the 1959 Chevrolet Bel Air would have died instantly. Lee, you want to take this? So what, what you're 
to do in a fire situation, and uh, this is something that uh, I think is often overlooked, uh, the number one thing you do is to go pull the fire alarm. Uh, you don't go reach for the fire extinguisher first. First you pull the fire alarm, then you go get the fire extinguisher, size up the fire, determine whether or not you think you can uh, put it out with an extinguisher, and if you can, go ahead and do that. If not, then you leave the building immediately and uh, call 911. Now, the alarm system should be hooked to a central station, and it should dial the fire. It should dial that, that central station. That central station dials the fire department, and so the fire department should be called and it should be well, and the fire department should be on their way. However, there's no harm in you dialing 911 on your cell phone. Just make sure that all of those automatic things, uh, in fact, work. And remember, pull the alarm before you try to fight the fire. Next. So the fire alarm, every house <clears throat> should have a centrally monitored uh, fire alarm system. And the cost to put a fire alarm system in a building, uh, retrofitting it to a building, is somewhere between $2 and $5 a square foot. So if you have a 12,000 square foot house, you're looking at $24,000. Uh, SAE has a national insurance program for property insurance. Not all houses are insured that way, but the SAE national, national policy or national uh, program on insurance will not uh, insure a house unless it has a centrally monitored fire alarm system. There are other insurance companies that will. Uh, however, we, we will not because, in our opinion, it does not save lives. It, puts lives at risk, and uh, the premium should either be so high that it causes you to install it uh, or, or take advantage of uh, you know, not having an alarm system in your building. 99% of the insurance companies only accept wired systems, hardwired is what you refer to, uh, and those, that means that there's a wire going from every uh, smoke detector to every smoke detector to a main panel. And if anybody were to tamper with, remove, uh, or otherwise interfere with the system by cutting a wire, taking a smoke uh, detector down, it sounds an alarm or it sends a signal to the monitoring company indicating that something is wrong and therefore uh, you, you should have an alarm system not necessarily a fire alarm system that calls the fire department, but you will have an alarm in the sense that someone will call and say, you need to make a repair. So that, that there's also a, a wireless system available, but most insurance companies will not uh, accept the wireless system uh, for the same reason that they will not accept a uh, standalone individual smoke detector that has that 9-volt battery or, uh, in it. it, it the batteries uh, turn up missing, they so sound a, 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 an alarm when they get weak, and they're taken out, thrown away, and they're basically not usable. So uh, in, in the hardwired or in the battery-powered units, if you don't have a, a hardwired system, Please don't ever cover a smoke detector. That's a felony. If you if you do that and you get caught doing it, you can be prosecuted. You don't want a felony on your record. The same thing for removing a, a, a smoke detector and the same thing for taking a battery out of one. Next. So uh, we've got a couple of examples of uh, what you commonly see in fraternity houses. Um, I can't tell you how many houses I've walked into. You walk into a bedroom and you see the plastic bag over the smoke detector, or you walk into the main party room and all the smoke detectors have plastic bags over them. Um, or uh, the example on the right, you walk into a room and the smoke detector is missing. Now, if a smoke detector is missing, hopefully the alarm panel should notice that and send a signal to the central monitoring station informing them that someone has disconnected their uh, fire alarm. Uh, that doesn't always happen. And then, of course, you see where someone's pulling the battery out. Uh, to reiterate what Lee Miller just talked about, 
I can tell you I've heard of a number of jurisdictions where if the fire marshal walks in and he sees a smoke detector covered with a plastic bag, he'll immediately have everyone move out of the house or he'll find the person whose bedroom it might be and I've heard of a fine of up to $2,000 for having your smoke detector covered. Um, you're going to hear uh, Lee Miller talk about this later, that the fire marshal is God. And uh, he pretty much can walk in and do what he wants. So ultimately, all of these could result in what we're trying to prevent, which is the loss of a life. These, these uh, systems are designed to save lives, and when you... Um, remove them or cover them up or take a battery out, they can't do what they're supposed to do. Lee, uh, why don't you cover some of the components that make up a fire alarm system? On the upper left-hand corner, you see a panel, and then there, the, the main panel is, is the one in the back, the taller one, which has a set of batteries in the bottom of it and basically contains all of the uh, electronic gear necessary to monitor the entire system and those three boxes below are enunciator panels that uh, would, would be for a very large structure where you have three pods or modules within the building, and each one of them would be monitoring uh, those separate areas. Uh, the, the smaller version, and what you might more likely find in a fraternity house, is the sort of the center picture where you see the monitoring enunciator panel on the bottom right. That happens to be the, the front uh, vestibule at Ohio Sigma, and right beside it is a picture of the house, and every room has a number on it, uh, the same number that's on the door, uh, above, above the door in the, in the fraternity house. And when a smoke detector goes off, uh, the number pops up on that green bar. You look on the screen, the fire department looks on the screen and can see exactly where it is so they don't have to run all over the house trying to figure out where the problem is. Uh, just above that is a list of all of the pertinent uh, people with phone numbers, the fire department's phone number, the monitoring company's phone number, uh, the house corporation president, and da da da, all are listed on that uh, right in the front of the house. There's another one of those in the basement in the next to the panel. The picture on the right is a pole station, which we've all seen, but maybe what you haven't seen is that clear plastic cover that goes over the top of it. There are two double-A batteries in the back that you can't see. When you lift the, the clear plastic cover, you get a pre-alarm. So the, it sounds like you have actually set the alarm off, but you haven't. It's designed in party situations, and, and when people are uh, maybe had too much to drink and they think they're going to have a prank and pull the alarm, uh, it makes them think that they have actually sounded the alarm when they lift the cover when, in fact, they haven't. Uh, it's just providing a, a tamper-proof sort of a, an approach. So uh, that's something that you can add to existing pull stations if you don't have them, or you can buy them if you're installing a brand-new system, and particularly in places uh, where there's a lot of guest traffic, uh, that might be a, a, a good idea. Bottom left-hand corner is the horn strobe uh, in, a, in a situation where you have someone who's hearing impaired. You have to have a light as well as a noisemaker. So there's a, a strobe light and, and the noisemaker. And the combination of all that together uh, makes for your fire alarm system. The only thing we haven't shown is the smoke detector, which you saw on a previous slide. Go ahead, Greg. So we can reduce your property insurance by up to 40%. A typical 12,000-square-foot uh, house uh, has a $10,000 premium. You, pay, uh, you can pay for a, a system, be it a sprinkler system or be it an alarm system, in somewhere uh, to, in that 10 to 12-year range. Uh, appropriate to know also that there are no recorded multiple deaths in any building ever that has been sprinklered since 1985 when they be, or 1885 when they've been keeping records. Uh, that doesn't mean that one person didn't die. The, the room in which the fire started, there may be a death, uh, although there's still a significant improvement in that statistic. But one person can die. Uh, however, the fire alarm system goes off and the sprinkler system goes off, 
And there never has been, where there's a sprinkler system, there's never been a, a second death recorded. So uh, a, a great statistic and a, and a great reason to have a sprinkler system. Many states require and are requiring fraternity houses to retrofit their houses. I know of nine states right now that require it, and every one of them has a pin in the map on the calendar as to when that has to happen. Uh, it's our belief that uh, eventually every state in the union will require every fraternity and sorority house to have a sprinkler system in it. So it's something that you should think about or talk about uh, now rather than later. Uh, in my opinion, later the costs will be higher. Right now they're, they're lower. The fire marshal is the guy you start with if you uh, have an interest in doing this. If you don't already have a sprinkler system, he and my book is is God. He can he, he by by code he can pretty much tell you what to do uh, and, and tell you anything and you pretty much have to follow what he is he says. So you want to make a friend out of him on the front end, you want to talk to him before you've even started and and uh, get him involved. There there are two components to the system, one being the pipe and the, and all of the sprinkler heads inside of the building. But there's also this issue of providing the water to fuel that. And, and the water line that comes from the street is the second piece of the puzzle. And depending upon where your house is, how far away from the street it is, is the fire are the fire hydrants on your street, on your side of the street, on the other side of the street? Does the water line go down the middle of the road? All of those variables, uh, plus the city codes, will determine how much it costs to get a pipe into your building. In our case at Ohio Sigma, the, the pipe that we had was big enough. So we, didn't, we had zero cost to provide that service, provide the water service. Other places uh, have been as much as 20 or 30 grand to, to do that. So you, you have to know uh, and figure all that out before you move forward. The code that applies to all this is National Fire Protection Association 13R. The R stands for residential, which has a lower hydraulic need. So there are fewer heads. The pipes are smaller in diameter, and the pipes can be plastic. So technology has allowed us to actually provide a, a great coverage uh, at a much lower cost. Next. <coughs> all right, I'm going to cover. Um, just some basic information on sprinkler heads. Um, for those that may have fraternity houses um, that had a sprinkler system installed, uh, let's say in the 70s, 80s, 90s, um, even, a, even not too recently, or even recently, you, what you'll see is sprinkler heads that are found kind of in the upper left-hand corner. Um, those are typically what you find in those kinds of applications. <laughs> And I wanted to point out that you'll see um, uh, there's a little glass tube uh, in the center of that. And that glass tube has a heat-sensitive material. And when that um, glass tube heats up to a certain temperature, it actually um, breaks that glass tube. And uh, water is then able to flow out of that sprinkler head. The problem with that technology was um, fraternity men tend to view these as coat hangers or hangers for clothes. And they go to put the hanger on it, and they hit that little glass tube and break it. And then you have a nice flood going on. Also, you could break it, obviously, with a baseball or football or anything else that people tend to throw around in a fraternity house. So luckily for us, technology continues to get better and better. And we are starting to see these concealed um, heads. And so on the right-hand side, you can see an example of some of the more concealed heads um, in the yellow box uh, where um, it protects it a little bit more. And um, what ends up happening is when that sprinkler head um, goes off, it actually pops the cap off, and then the sprinkler head is able to hopefully um, put out the fire. Uh, just an example of a, of a more recent technology, you'll see the um, bottom one. That's a Tyco head. Um, those are the most recent technologies of what sprinkler heads are starting to look like. Um, and these are certainly um, great for preventing false activation. So we've really come a long way in terms of the technology on these sprinkler heads. 
Um, moving on, I wanted to show you a, an example of a retrofit of a house. Um, you'll see here we've got, this is Washington State University. Uh, we went ahead and um, sprinklered that building um, and just basically um, the sprinkler pipe was put on the outside of the wall. It ran along the outside of the walls, the ceilings. And as you can see, um, you've got this orange plastic pipe uh, all over the house. And so um, I wanted to point out one of the nice things about this is that you can actually paint the pipe uh, to match the facade. And so here's an example of where they've gone ahead to and painted the pipe. So uh, the picture on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, the pipe was painted white to match the walls and the ceiling, and it sort of blends in pretty nice. On the left-hand side, unfortunately, they decided to paint the pipe brown. I don't know if it was considered as an accent trim, um, but as you can see, it, uh, it they wanted it to kind of blend in, but in my opinion, it sort of, sort of sticks out. But the point being is if you do a retrofit and you have exposed pipe, you can paint it to um, blend in with the existing surroundings. Um, here's another way that you can um, hide the pipe. You can actually build bulkheads around it. Uh, I've given you an, a, a picture on the um, upper left-hand corner. You can see from the picture that uh, the bulkhead has started to be um, built around that pipe. Um, and then you can see where the pipe comes through. And then you can also see where the sprinkler head sticks out of the bulkhead. So once that bulkhead is completely built, it will certainly blend in much nicer than having just a pipe, an orange pipe on the wall, or even painting the pipe. Um, and then on the bottom um, picture, uh, what we did is we wanted to show you here uh, a, an absolute no-no. And it could just be the picture, but the sprinkler head is um, actually painted pink in this picture. And uh, under no circumstances ever can a sprinkler head be painted. Um, that is to remain the factory color um, and in the factory condition that it was installed. Never, never paint a sprinkler head um, because it could affect the ability of the head to um, how it handles the heat and going off um, when it's supposed to. If I could just uh, interject in that uh, picture, if you see the orange pipe going along the wall, if that pipe were raised up and put right in the corner where the, or the wall and the ceiling come together, the size of that bulkhead uh, would go way down in size. Uh, it's conceivable, and we have done it in, in several houses, where you just put a, a large piece of crown molding to hide the pipe behind the crown molding because it's tucked up into the corner. Okay. All right, the next video is intended to show you how a fire sprinkler system can save your life if, it were to, uh, if a fire were to ignite in your room anywhere in the chapter house. So give me one second. Still trying to get, the, get this. Recently shared. You can't allow the the, uh, the arrow to slide outside of the white box. It's, I'm not. <laughs> it just goes away. I don't know. Recently shared. I need your help here, James. Are you able to help at all? Okay. Perfect. So we sped this, this video up. We sped it up um, to show uh, what it would look like um, uh, in four times as quick as it normally would go. So you've got a room here that's sprinklered on top and a non-sprinklered room on the bottom. Um, the, uh, you'll see here um, the fire is starting to get bigger. In about a minute and 59 seconds, uh, the sprinkler system will go off for a minute and 51 seconds. So now the fire has been put out in the room that does uh, that has a sprinkler system. So now we continue watching the room that does not have a sprinkler system in it. And the fire is continuing to get bigger. So 
smoke is uh, filling the room up. At this point, I think it would be very difficult uh, for someone to breathe or see. Here's a view from the outside of the room. As you can see, this fire is starting to get very, very large. Um, I would point out that hopefully you would have fire rated walls and ceilings to prevent this fire from spreading to other rooms or the room above it. Um, at about five minutes, we start blowing out windows. <laughs> I think it's pretty safe to say, um, you know, the fire department certainly not going to be able to be there within five minutes of the fire starting. Um, you know, I would I would say that a fire department's not going to be there for at least eight to ten minutes after a fire starts. And we're already at seven minutes, and you can see how large this fire is by now. <laughs> Here's showing some uh, difference in the, how the rooms ended up. All right, let's go back. Um, oh, perfect. Thank, thank you, James. All right, Lee, uh, if you want to take uh, fire extinguishers, well, I'll first start with saying uh, we, we've got We've got two types of fire extinguishers. Um, we've got ABC extinguishers, um, and we have a short video we're going to show you here in a second. And, uh, and th these are the predominant fire extinguishers that you see in most chapter houses. And then we have a type K fire extinguisher. These are found in kitchens usually uh, because they're used to fight uh, grease. So we've got a fire extinguisher video. Um, uh, James, um, if you don't mind, uh, trying to bring that fire extinguisher video up. Perfect. We've got a little video for you guys to listen to. Alert! Before using a fire extinguisher, ensure that someone notifies the fire department, alerts others about the fire, begins evacuating others from the premises. Fire extinguishers are for controlling small fires before they have a chance to spread. Before using one, make sure that you have a clear escape, you are familiar with the operating instructions of the fire extinguisher and that the fire extinguisher you have is suitable for the fire you're facing. Before using the extinguisher on a fire, look at the fire class symbols on the front label to make sure the extinguisher you have is suitable for the type of fire you're facing. The most common classes of fires are A, B, C, and K. Class A fires involve common combustibles like wood, paper, and tires. Class B fires involve flammable liquids like gasoline and petroleum oil. Class C ratings involve energized equipment or things that are plugged in like appliances, computers, televisions, and electric machinery. Class K fires involve cooking oils and greases like vegetable fats. Once you've determined that the extinguisher is the correct type for the hazard, proceed to operate the extinguisher using the pass technique to control and extinguish the fire. First, hold the extinguisher upright and pull the pin. Next, stand 8 to 10 feet from the fire and aim the nozzle at the base of the fire. Do not get too close or aim the nozzle too high. Once the nozzle is aimed at the base of the fire, squeeze the levers together to begin discharge of the fire extinguishing agent. Maintain your distance from the fire and sweep the nozzle from side to side, sweeping 3 to 6 inches beyond the right and left edges of the fire. Discharge the extinguisher until contents are exhausted to prevent reignition. Move around the fire to confirm it is completely extinguished. Your quick action can save lives and protect property. Using the fire extinguisher properly is only one part of a fire safety plan. For more information and training videos, go to www.femalifesafety.org. Okay, James, you can kill it. Uh, Lee, you want to take uh, the lead on this? My recommendation to, to every chapter is that you find uh, either the local fire department or an alum who happens to be on a fire department or know somebody that is, and you get your chapter together and you, you play, basically. You learn how to use an extinguisher. The first time I ever used an extin extinguisher it was a can of gasoline. An open can, a big old coffee can full of gas that ignited, and I hit it with a fire extinguisher. I was way too close, 
and I, I blew it all over the room, and I had 10 or 15 little tiny fires going because I didn't know how to use the extinguisher, and I got too close to it and actually blew it uh, all over the place. So uh, this is a great exercise. You'll see here the chapter has gathered, uh, at least the majority of them, and that one by one they have used the extinguishers and, and actually experimented with how you put a fire out. Next. So moving out of the fire world uh, into the emergency lighting world, uh, every house needs to have emergency lighting. It's a code requirement. I assume you, you each have them. Uh, technology, again, is uh, allowing us to reduce the costs of these, make them more efficient, and uh, they are uh, readily available in your big box stores at, at pretty respectable prices. Uh, if you buy just an exit sign, you should uh, you shouldn't pay uh, you should pay under fifty dollars for one. The combination exit and uh, and the emergency light may be as as much uh, as eighty dollars. Uh, they're all using LED lights. At least that's what you should look for because the amount of energy it takes to use uh, to fire up an LED is so much less. The battery can be smaller. The whole cost of the unit goes down and the longevity of the battery and the ability for it to provide an hour and a half, that's the requirement, is an hour and a half of light uh, goes way up. Uh, the, the cardinal sin is to mount one of these units in a place, uh, particularly the emergency light by itself, the picture of the one in the middle, uh, the cardinal sin is to mount that someplace that is not, does not lead the person towards an exit. People in a, in a fire or smoky room situation will always go towards the light, so you want the light to always lead the person to an exit, uh, never to a blank wall or a way that they can't get out of the building. The, the picture on the left is there only to, to suggest that there are some states and cities that require an emergency light outside of the exit doors in the building so that if there's steps or anything that's out there, you have uh, illumination or light that you can see once you exit the building and you don't have accidents on the outside of the building. You, you would never mount the unit on the outside because the battery can't handle the changes in temperature. Uh, so the basic unit would be inside. A pair of wires would go through the wall to, uh, to fire up or to illuminate the, uh, the fixture that's mounted outside the door. Next. And the electrical world, of course, uh, everybody, uh, every, every house in the country is not a brand new house with a gazillion receptacles. Uh, the, 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 the example on the left is probably a bit of an exaggeration, at least hopefully it is. Uh, the, the plug strip on the right is uh, what is, is most desirable and, and what you uh, probably have throughout your house. The, the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that you can buy a plug strip uh, with a multiple, multiple different lengths of, of a cord. So you can buy one with a 15-foot cord. That's the longest one I've seen. And you can buy them from anywhere from 15 feet down to 3 feet. Uh, and, and the only reason I point that out is that it's absolutely against every rule in the book to plug one strip plug strip into another plug strip. So... If you go to the store and you just arbitrarily buy a three-footer and you really needed a six, uh, the tendency might be, okay, I'll go buy another extension cord or I'll get another plug strip and plug one into the other, and that uh, is a no-no. So if you can't find it at the local box store, if their inventories uh, don't have the 15-foot the uh, and, and three or four choices all the way down to three feet, Go online. You can buy them online. Uh, most of the time, you would always want one with a surge protector. The added cost is, is almost, in, it, you almost can't see the added cost. And, it, and one of the advantages that you can look for is to buy them that have a 90-degree cord on the uh, uh, plug on the end of the cord so that instead of the wire sticking straight out of the receptacle, it, it, it points down. So it's much easier. Uh, uh, less of an obstacle in the room. You can push a piece, a piece of furniture up against it and it doesn't bump into it. It's, uh, the, the more desirable plug is, is like the one that comes on the refrigerator where it's, uh, the cord hangs straight down. I've also seen 
plug strips attach permanently, uh, running a cord along the top of the base mold, uh, attaching the cord to the base mold with the tie wraps that have a little hole or a little tab that allow you to screw it down to the base molding. And the, and the plug strip, in a particularly, this is particularly good in an older home where you don't have as many receptacles, and you mount them along the top edge of the, the you mount the, the cord along the top edge of the base molding, uh, and you go 3 feet, 15 feet, uh, 6 feet, 8 feet, whatever it is, wherever you need a receptacle. And, and HomeCore uh, could hopefully do some of that for you uh, so that, there's not the extension cords running all over the, the building or all over the room underneath cord or under underneath the carpets, et cetera. Next. So the rules of the game are uh, the, uh, all extension cords have to be a three-wire cord. We all know, I, I, I trust we all know what a zip cord is. That's the two-wire cord like comes on a, on a table lamp. Uh, if you get an end of it, you can pull it apart like a zipper. That's where the word comes from. Uh, they, they're not grounded. They're not safe. Uh, don't buy any extension cords that are two-wire. Every extension cord in your house should be a three-wire, typically round cord with a, ground, a grounded receptacle and a grounded plug. Uh, never put them under the carpet, whether they're two-wire or three-wire. Never across a door opening or you know any place where there's traffic. I've already said, don't ever plug a, one into a one plug mold or, or strip into another one. Uh, always buy them with surge protectors. Always buy the right length. Always buy the ones with 90 degree plugs. Never plug one into another. Attach the plug to the base molding if possible. Da 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 da. Next. Next is blank. James, we got to show the video of um, of what not to do. So this is uh, an example. Well, I won't, I won't talk. Example of what not to do: two wire cord plugged into outlet, tied around the fixture, running across into the bedroom area tied around a close uh, hanger and the close hanger it goes whoops I shouldn't have shown you that uh, over to a hook on the wall which pointed in that uh, goes down and it gets plugged into a uh, this is of course a two wire cord now it's plugged into a three wire and the three wire cord uh, goes down and uh, hooks into a, a plug strip and a power strip uh, is uh, powering who knows what including the uh, floor lamp sitting here. In addition to that we have an outlet on the wall with no cover plate. We have another outlet on the wall with no cover plate. We have a um, cord from an extension cord, two wire uh, actually, it's a three-wire cord, flat cord. It goes down underneath the pile of clothes, uh, goes up the wall, uh, plugs into uh, a, another uh, cord, which goes upstairs into the sleeping area, uh, which is uh, by itself uh, not safe because there's no sprinkler head located in the in the sleeping or ceiling area, and uh, so the bedroom or the bed is located in a loft up above. You can see the can, the steel can, which houses the sprinkler line. The sprinkler line goes over and in the adjacent room there is a sprinkler head actually located in that space. And so this is properly, this uh, area is properly protected with a sprinkler head. So obviously that's an example of what not to do. Um, we're, uh, Greg, you're going to take the GFCI? Yeah, um, so a GFCI is a, uh, is, a, is a way to protect uh, your house in the case um, 
that you don't have a grounded outlet. So let's say you have a two-prong outlet. It doesn't have a ground outlet. Uh, you can have an electrician install what's called a GFCI box, which makes it a grounded outlet. And most of the time, you'll see these, though, in areas that there's water. We've got a little video we just want to show you on how a GFCI box works. So we could cue up the video. Ground Fault Circuit Interrupters, or GFCIs, have saved thousands of lives over the last three decades. Found mostly in areas where electrical products might come in contact with water, such as bathrooms, kitchens, and outdoors, a GFCI is a special type of outlet designed to cut off power before a deadly electrical shock can occur. For example, when you plug in an appliance like a hairdryer, energy flows from the outlet to the device. A GFCI monitors that amount of electricity. If there's any leakage or interruption of that current, such as when the hairdryer comes in contact with water, the GFCI cuts power to the device in as quickly as one thirtieth of a second before a deadly shock can occur. GFCIs should be tested once a month to make sure they're working properly. Here are a few simple steps to follow. Push the reset button on the GFCI to prepare for testing. Plug a nightlight or similar electrical device into the receptacle. The light should turn on. Push the test button. The nightlight should go off. Complete the test by pushing the reset button again. The nightlight should turn on. If the nightlight does not turn off when the test button is pushed, then the GFCI may be improperly installed or damaged and does not offer shock protection. Contact a licensed electrician to check the GFCI and correct the problem. All right, the next topic that we want to discuss is emergency evacuation plans, paths of egress. On the back side of every room, somewhere at least in every room and on the back side of every door in a bedroom should be a blueprint of the house. And that blueprint should show some sort of red path that goes from the bedroom to the emergency exit and out the house. And that should be the safest way to get out of the house in case of a fire or some other natural disaster that would require you to leave the house immediately. And so uh, just make sure that this is found on the back of every door. The James R. Favor Agency, the insurance company that the fraternity uses, this is a requirement that they have. So. Uh, another way just to help save a life. Um, Lee, if you want to cover uh, fire-rated doors and panic bars and hardware related to that. Again, uh, technology and uh, an example of a fire in a restaurant years ago uh, where all the people piled up at the door and several hundred people uh, were, were killed because the person at the door couldn't turn the handle because everybody was pushing on the door. So today we have what we call crash bars, uh, panic bars, a uh, number of different names for them. And of course, the door that has the crash bar on it is fire rated typically, or it's an exterior door. And every one of them uh, is supposed to be closed and have a door closer on it. And every one of the doors should be fire rated. And that little emblem that you see there is uh, giving you the specifications on the door. Please don't paint over that, that tag. It's on the edge of the door, typically where the hinges are, uh, and, and it should always be there for the fire marshal uh, to see and authenticate that you do, in fact, have a fire-rated door. And, of course, whenever you put any pressure on any of these doors, they automatically open. They would not uh, prohibit you from, from uh, exiting. Next. So the, the, the other issue, of course, that we have are door stops. Uh, everybody has seen the piece of concrete, the, the wedge, the door stop, as you see the picture on the right, uh, keeping that fire rated door open because it has a door closer on it because it is fire rated and it's intended to compartmentalize the building. And if you have a fire alarm system, or even if you don't and you go to put one in, the, the item on your left is a magnet that is activated whenever the system is in its neutral position. 
And the minute somebody pulls a fire alarm or the system is automatically activated by a smoke detector or any other device, the magnet is, is broken and the door automatically closes. So the rectangular box is mounted on the wall and that has the magnet in it and the wires going to it to, to create the magnet. The disc is mounted on the door and as long as the fire alarm system is in is not uh, been activated, the magnet will hold the door open, and th therefore you have the the benefit of, of both the door being open and it being a safe environment because it automatically closes when uh, the fire alarm system is activated. Go ahead. This is an example of how not to, uh, this, this would be on a check sheet uh, that you should look at. That's flammable items in those, uh, in those uh, containers. Those are probably full of uh, roofing material uh, that uh, is used to, to coat a roof and all the cardboard. Of course, anytime you have a fire or anytime the fire department shows up, one of the first places they go is to the electrical room because Fire and water don't mix, and uh, or fire and electricity rather don't mix, and so you you want to turn off in many cases the the power. Uh, you can't have uh, this sort of a, a situation, and that would be true for your hallways and your stairwells. Uh, every path of egress uh, has to be clear. There should be no couches or desks or <coughs> anything in the hallways. The width of a hallway is typically driven by the fire marshal, and they calculate the width of the needed width of the hallway based on a fully equipped fireman or two that, that have to pass each other and turn around in a hallway, and that's how they come up with a minimum of four feet uh, of open space. That's the typical minimum, exceptions to all rules. Next. So we have a uh, housing inspection form that uh, we will have on the website uh, that will give you an opportunity to check things. It's just a reminder, serves as a reminder, so your house manager, your, your house corporation officer, whoever you assign or whoever you expect to have it done, there are some things that need to be checked on a weekly basis, some things on a yearly basis and everything in between, and you can go download the list, and it will provide you with an opportunity to, to go check to see uh, is, uh, are there no flammables and obstacles in the electric room? Uh, is, are all the fire extinguishers uh, charged, or did somebody play with one last week and, and discharge it, hang it back up on the wall, and not tell anybody that it had been discharged? And that's typical because they don't, if they played with it, it's, we're back to being prosecuted and it being a felony and all that jazz. So the, the bottom line is the check sheet gives you an opportunity to remember all the things that you might not otherwise remember. It'll be on the website. You can download it. Next. Okay. Um, we're going to try to hurry through this. A Knox box is a, a little box found on the outside of the door of, of a fraternity house a lot of times um, at the front door. And what it is, it's a little box that has a key on the outside, and the only, only the fire department has an actual um, key that opens that Knox box. And inside that Knox box should contain the master key to get into the building and to get into every bedroom. So that in the case of a fire, the fire department doesn't have to break down doors. They can simply get the master key out of it. Now, some of the houses have door codes on the front door. So if you do have a door code, make sure that you put the code in there. And if you update, um, well, I say put the code in there, make sure you tell the fire department what the code is so they can put it in. And if you update the code on the front door, make sure you inform the fire department so they can update that code in the Knox box. Um, you can get these Knox boxes either flush mounted like you see, or they can stick out. Um, but you do actually have to order them through um, a company called Knox, and that's why they're called Knox boxes. And and I think 99.99% of all of these are they've got a pretty much a monopoly on the market right now. Uh, some other real quick miscellaneous information from 2011 to 2012: six undergrads died in fires. All of them occurred in off-campus housing. From 2000 to 2012, there were 152 undergraduates that died in fires. 
Of those, 130 died in off-campus housing, 10 in residence halls, 10 in Greek housing, and two in other. So I, I would, I would uh, say it's safe to say that um, fraternity housing is pretty safe <clears throat> on par with um, residence halls. Um, the primary causes of death were a lack of automatic fire sprinkler systems, missing or disabled smoke alarms, careless disposal of smoking materials, impaired judgment from alcohol consumption, and fires originating from upholstered furniture on decks or porches. So, any oh, questions uh, for us, or have we bored you to death? <laughs> If anybody's got any questions, please go ahead and post them out there right now. And not seeing any gentlemen, I think you covered the topic so well. Uh, please be aware that you can also email Greg and Lee at any time. Ask them any questions, they'll be happy to give you plenty of answers. Uh, Greg, Lee, any closing thoughts? Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and like uh, James said, our email addresses and phone numbers are listed on this uh, presentation. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions, and if anyone needs uh, financial resources for life safety improvements, um, and, uh, please don't hesitate to call us. All right, gentlemen, this presentation will be posted on YouTube later tonight and a survey about the uh, webinar will be going out shortly. Thank you, and bye.